Hello, everyone. I just wanted to start today's episode with a couple of special plugs. So recently, um, there was a call out on Twitter for, uh, you know, people within the writers community to kind of, you know, start following each other and, you know, expanding our uh, friend loop because, you know, writers are kind of, you know, uh, by nature, lonely, quiet people. Um, so yeah, like, you know, a lot of us, you know, fellow writers, we all, you know, all of our follower accounts like jumped up quite a bit and, you know, we got to know each other a little more and I decided to help out, which is, you know, something I love to do, help out people who, you know, could use just like a little boost. Um, but you know, if they had anything they wanted to promote to just let me know and I would just throw on a three promotion on my show just because, you know, I want to, I like helping people. So, uh, what follows is a couple of promotions of some people and I want to just apologize if I uh, say your name incorrectly. I'm going to do my best. Um, but this first one comes from Daniela Levy and uh, she wants to promote her uh, uh, blog called The Rejection Survival Guide. So be sure to check out rejectionsurvivalguide.com, which just by that title alone sounds kind of awesome if you're like... It, have any interest in writing and things like that. Um, now this next one, I feel like an idiot cause I didn't ask for their, um, actual name and I'm not sure if the name in the email is their actual name or if it's just their screen name. And I am just kind of like going through the emails as, uh, I'm promoting this, but, uh, it goes under the tag, you know, his Twitter handle is a uh, Harley Quinn Grimm. And that's uh, H-A-R-L-E-Q-U-I-N, Grimm, G-R-I-M. Uh, and they're promoting their podcast, Mania Podcast. Uh, and I'm just going to read this little blurb he sent me. Is uh, My podcast is called Mania. It is a historical fiction and horror podcast which takes events and villains from the past and creates stories out of them. And Okay, all right, right there. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, uh, scrolling here, it says you might phrase it as an R-rated version of lore. Um, so, I mean, if you haven't listened to the lore podcast, definitely check that out, but this sounds awesome. Like taking inspiration from history and turning it into stories. So 100% check that out. Um, this next one and last one is, uh, from, uh, I'm no way I'm going to pronounce this last name correctly. Uh, Stephanie Diaul, D E O U L. Um, but uh, she's an author and says, I am the author of the young adult mystery series, The Sid Rubin Silicone Alley Adventures. Uh, Silicon, yeah, Silicon Alley, I guess like Silicon Valley, maybe. Um, the first book in the series um, says, On a LARP, introduce the world to teenage, self described, lesbianic, brainiac, coder, uh, this name, uh, Sidoni, Sid Rubin, and her diverse posse of friends. And I'm rather pleased to say the world embraced her back. LARP has won several awards, including an IPPY for multicultural fiction. I don't know what that word is. IPPY? IPPY? I don't know. Um, Multicultural fiction, juvenile, young adult. The school library journal made it a pick for Pride Curve magazine. Um, It's the kind of book that makes me excited for my daughters to grow up and read. Uh, So, okay, the second book, or the first book is called On a LARP. The second book is called Zero Sum Game, and book three, Say Her Name, is in the process of being written and is due out this December. So there's a nice trilogy of books, you know, get the first two, uh, maybe spread them out throughout the year, and then by the end of the year, you got the third one ready to go. So again, that's uh, Stephanie Dial, and Stephanie spelled S-T-E-F-A-N-I, Dial, D-E-O-U-L, and the books are On a LARP, Zero Sum Game, and then in December, say her name. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I just be sure to check all this stuff out. Like, let's let's help each other out. You know, uh, we're all kind of just doing our thing, doing it ourselves. We don't have a lot of help, so anything you can do would be appreciated. So be sure to check those out and enjoy the rest of the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shelve Podcast. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. 
Uh, I just want to apologize. The audio on this intro is probably not the best compared to my most other episodes because I'm recording this with my top uh, directional microphone attachment instead of an actual plugged in microphone because I forgot to bring it with me when I decided to record this. Um, So I just want to apologize for that. But welcome to today's new episode. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. Um, Yeah, so this past weekend was uh, Chicago Comic Con C2E2, as it's called. And uh, I actually got to go as the press and uh, picked up some, you know, different recordings, uh, you know, exchanged some emails. So I got some fun content coming, starting with today's episode, which is the uh, interview I did or press uh, pool I did with uh, uh, executive producers and actor of Into the Badland, uh, Miles Millar. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce this other guy's last name. Uh, but uh, Daniel Wu, who, you know, executive producer and actor. And uh, Alfred, I think it's Gao? Go? It's G-O-U-G-H. Um, but yeah, uh, they also, you know, creators of Smallville. Um, yeah, so uh, I got to go and see the premiere of the new episode of Into the Badlands for their last episodes of Season 3, which if you have never seen Into the Badlands, it is a uh, martial arts show on AMC. It is a awesome, fantastic show. I really enjoy it, um, especially you know Daniel Wu. You know worked heavily with Jackie Chan, so if you're into that kind of stuff, you should be checking out this show. And it's kind of sad that it's ending so soon. Um, I really this is a show I wish got like like seven to ten seasons somewhere in there because it's really fun. Um, also, Nick Frost comes in in season two, and it just becomes like a whole different thing. But uh, yeah, so I got to sit in on the panel at C2E2. They debuted the episode a day early, um, and then they had their uh, two-night premiere, which uh, I saw the first night's episode, which was uh, last night as of this episode's posting, and then that new episode is tonight on AMC, which I'm just trying to double-check the time here. I believe it is on 8 o'clock Central Time. Could be 9 o'clock, so... Okay, yeah, so it is 9 o'clock, so 9 o'clock Central Time, so whatever your time zone is, uh, I would check it out. Um, the show is, is really good, and also all the other seasons are on Netflix, so if you need to catch up, I highly recommend it. It's very quick to get through. So check out Into the Badlands, and what follows is, so after the panel, we got to uh, you know sit down and ask questions with press, so there's me asking a couple questions, there's other people asking questions, and you know them responding, so you'll be able to hear all of that. Um, the way this was recorded is I did have to like set my recorder down on the table. So you'll be able to hear all of them perfectly. The questions themselves, I'm going to try to bump up the audio as much as I can, but I don't want to like really mess it up. So it could be a little difficult to hear the questions, but hopefully I did my best in editing for you guys to be able to hear that. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into the, uh, press panel for AMC's into the badlands on nine o'clock central time. Be sure to check it out every Monday. Dude, your jacket is on point. It's like perfect. I've seen some. I've seen some very bad versions of that before, but that one's good. The, the belt and everything is like. Trust me, I know that belt. I wore it for all the season. <laughs> I had a love-hate relationship with that thing. You just need the New Orleans heat as yes, well. Yes, yeah. It has to be 110 degrees. Yeah, yeah. try wearing that in 110 degree heat for six months. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my first question is. Well, what we, we, what we would do is in the fight camp is see what the particular actor was good at. So if they're good at grappling, we make them do grappling. If they're good at kicks, we make them do kicks. You know, we didn't want to make them do stuff they were bad at, and that's what you, it's your job as a director when you're directing actors is not try to make them perform something they can't do. Like do work to their strengths, and so we apply that to the action as well. It's like what. First of all, what is the character, and how does the character uh, operate in this world, right? And then we look at the actor and what they can do, and we try to meld those two things together. So it's, it, it, there's a plethora of styles that we dip into from all that. 
um, you know, I, I would say Babu's character is more Southern Chinese style uh, fighting, where he's like solid, low stances, but really strong arms, you know, and all his poses come from the Southern style of like Hungar and Charlie Fett and stuff like that. Um, um, and so like it varies depending on the actor and depending on the situation. So, and then, you know, then we get someone like Lewis who has a lot of experience and so he can do a lot of different stuff. And so we bring that in. Or we bring someone who's, or someone likes to do flips. Like Aramis loves to be on the wires, right? And he never formally learned that. He's just naturally good at that. So we have him do a lot of wire work, you know? And, and it, it really depends on the person and what they like to do. And we just try to cater to them, you know? And that's what makes it work. Okay, next question. Two questions. Um, you made a comment about the- um, Take my medicine. Sorry. You made a comment you know, your stunt coordinators and your uh, you know, fight coordinators that they should have been nominated for an Emmy. I think clearly all of them. Yeah. Too. And you know, there's some issues there. And so I don't know, maybe you know, they may want to talk about that. But the other question, more to the style, because I know this is one of the things that Jackie Chan taught to um, some of the American people who did the fight, you know, fight scenes, not in your case, but in mm -hmm. that, that, that the Americans always want to go big and this and this. And then Jackie Chan always says, no, you have to stay close and, you know, this way, right. I noticed that the, the, the fight scene with you and, uh, and the pilgrim, it was really close in, then you guys go out, but then you guys come really, really close in again. Right, so. right. Um, for your first question, it needs your help. You guys need to be writing stuff going like, why isn't this show getting nominated for all these things? Like, you guys need to be doing that because there's only so much we can do. I mean, I tried to complain about it on Twitter. I was fucking angry because I looked at some of the show reels that got turned in and got nominated, and it's, frankly speaking, shit. Like shit, and like, how are those guys getting nominated and we're not, right? Um, so that's I'm very passionate about this sub subject, but it really relies on your guys' help to spread that out there and get people aware. Because really, frankly speaking, the people voting they're lazy; they don't watch everything, right? So they go, oh, I heard of this show, and they do action. We'll click that, right? They don't actually watch it. But if you get out there and make the noise for us, and uh, and make them pay attention to it, then I think that will help. Um, and going back to the Jackie Chan action, what was the question again? It was just oh, oh yeah, so 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 for that was it was important that we we always want it wide because we always want to see the full action. Babu is an incredible mover. I'm pretty good at that stuff too. So we want to see all that stuff, but we also want to see the technique. So we're there, there's a grappling technique. There's arm locking in China, which is in Chinese is a certain kind of uh, grappling. We wanted to see the technique being clear. So you're telling a story through the fight, and so that determines how we edit it and how what we're trying to show there. And we have great guys on set who are stuntmen and actors and filmmakers who are, who are there helping us edit. So once we shoot it, they're putting it together, we look at it and go, okay, that's what we want. Then we send it to the main editors in Toronto and go, this is, this is the completed fight, here's what it is, and they take it from there. Um, and they don't really get involved in creating the fight. We do it all ourselves, so it's a full package. And I think that's the biggest difference in the West. And from my experience of working on Tomb Raider, it's such a disjointed process of making the action. The choreographer does his thing, the cameraman does his thing, the director does his thing, and then the editor is the one who makes the fight in the, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the editing room. And that's bullshit, it shouldn't be done that way. Yeah, in, you know? in, in American films and, and television, we always say the fight is covered, but it's not actually directed. Yeah. And there's not a story. And the first thing which we said in, in, the, in there was, why are we fighting? What's the story of the fight? It's the first thing Dee Dee asks us to. What, right. what story are we telling in this fight? And having done two movies with Jackie, Shanghai Noon was shot in Canada, and he had just come off rush hour and was very unhappy with the action. And, and frankly, in Shanghai Noon, he was unhappy with a bunch of it. And a lot of times what you're fighting there is the style of U.S. and Canadian stunt people and, and, a, and sort of an ingrained culture that didn't really let Jackie be Jackie. And so when we did Shanghai Nights, we shot it in Prague, and David Dobkin, who directed the first three episodes of Into the Badlands, sat with Jackie and said, what weren't you happy with? Jackie explained it, and David worked out a system where Jackie, that was one of the, the first American movie he was a fight director on. So he, you know, so he was able to do that, and you know, I'll say the, the fights in, in Shanghai Nights are definitely a step up from Shanghai Noon because Jackie was, you know, directly allowed involved. Yeah, and, involved. and directly involved. And I think that's, that's the thing is, you know, American studios and stuff, they're like, we love Jackie. They bring Jackie over and then try to put him in a box and you don't let Jackie be Jackie. So I think, I think it was trying to find that, that balance. And one of the reasons, you know, we went after David to do, to do this because we knew he was the only American director we knew who had worked with a Hong Kong 
fight crew successfully. And it was that melding of an American drama with Hong Kong action and what was that going to look like and how was that going to work and how can we seamlessly intertwine the two of them. Well, yeah, it was that the respect that he gave because what, what the, I think the biggest difference is the choreographers from Hong Kong are actually filmmakers, yeah. right? And they're making a story through their fight and they're respected for that. Whereas in the States, it's like, oh, it's a second unit. It's an action guy. It's covered. And, you know, it's and covered and whatever, yeah. but it's not an integrated whole in terms of right. the, the filming, the choreography, and then the editing. And so what we do is, on, on Badlands, and the gift that we've had that we for so many seasons was to be able to have that autonomy and be able to create that fight and then just turn in the fight to the editor at the end. But on the first point, which is the lack of recognition for the fight, the fight team, it is a disgrace. Yeah. It is a disgrace on the academy uh, that... Whatever you say about the show, the one thing this show does best on television, there's not, no comparison, is the action. The fact that it was never recognized by the Academy is a disgrace. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if it's racism or uh, old boy, or network. boy network, but it's actually a disgrace. Yeah. And is the fact that it, we've never been nominated for the action is like, it's inexplicable. Oh, I mean, it's angry, it's fuming. Like every year that comes around, I just like steam comes out of my head and I go rant. Just because no other, no other show treats it in the same way. We have had a, a dedicated fight unit on this show from inception. No, every other show on television has a three day Except for set Game of Thrones has a three day second second unit. So the fact that it was never recognized just points to the corruption of that institution. So it is, I don't know if it's racism or what it is, but it needs to be uh, rectified, yeah, rectified sure. immediately. Yeah. We still have a chance this is the last half of the season. So if you guys help us, we got a chance. Do you have any funny stories about the cast? Oh man. Oh. <laughs> oh man. So so many. Like who and what? Like Oh god, like Nick I mean Nick is like a character. He's like I mean like I was saying in that panel, I was like, that's one of the most things I'm gonna miss the most is that personal relationship I had with him and how fucking funny he is as a person, just like uh, every day, like we're in sometimes we're really stressful messed up situations, you know, making this show. And he just finds the humor in everything. And that just makes the day go so much easier. Um, this, just his comment, running commentary on everything is funny. Um, he's dark, he's dark like me. Like, I like that stuff. I don't vocalize my humor as much as he does, <laughs> but I appreciate it so much uh, that he's yeah, there. Yeah, Nick doing... talked about the food. The Irish food, not so good. Yeah, that's probably uh, the worst thing about Nick had a few comments about the food. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, there's so much funny stuff, like Sherman and how vain he is. He's very vain. Um, and he's, he'll never show up on time. If you go to dinner at 5 or 6 o'clock, he'll be there at 7, you know, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, we have a great relationship. We, you know, we built this great family over three seasons. And so we just had a blast. We have a blast. Everybody loves each other. There's no beef or anything like that on, on set. And, uh, and it's a pleasure. It was such a pleasure to be with all those talented people. Why has it been so important for you to show women in various power structures in the bad man? I think it's a key tenet of martial arts. So like yeah. Al is saying, is like martial arts is, a, is an equalizer. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, a man or a woman, body size or whatever. If you're good at it, you're good at it. And so that leads to yeah. characters that can be powerful. You know? and, and for us, it was, it was what's the sort of future you want to see. And we wanted it to be an, ethnic, an ethnically diverse future and a future where you know, women had power and women had agency. And to be honest, because you don't see it so much, you go, that's just an interesting dynamic to write. They're just, they were just interesting to write and it felt fresh. Um, and we got fantastic actors to do it. So I think it's something that, um, you know, that we really kind of leaned into. And it's funny watching, I haven't seen that episode in six months. Mm. And to see like, you know, it's, it's basically Chow, the widow, um, and the master are kind of really, and Cressida, are, you know, you have four incredibly strong female characters going forward in this last eight episodes. Um, yeah, I just, you know, the show running in three seasons and this being its last season, I was kind of work, uh, wondering when it came to approaching the season, how you guys kind of took the approach with it being the last season, and were there any kind of future storylines that you would hope to do that you had to consolidate for this last season? There was some, we started to get inkling, they never come out and tell you, but you can, we, Miles and I have been doing this long enough where you can sort of read the signals. So we, we knew that there were two things. One, 
we knew this 16 episode arc was going to have its own conclusion. Like we we knew if the show had gone on that we were going to reboot, then reboot and then take the show in a in a different direction. So that was already kind of baked into the storytelling. And and we had, you know, divide even before we knew the air schedule had said we're going to do this eight episode arc and then this eight episode arc. And then once we kind of could see the writing on the wall, there are certain there are certain storylines that we that we definitely went back and well, not went back, but as we were doing them, we knew we were writing to a conclusion, which can also be very exciting, mm. you know, because you can you start to bring things to an end. But we left a bunch of doors open too, so you know it doesn't feel like. But it is very satisfying. Yeah. I mean, that's there's. I think you will watch the complete series and yeah. be very satisfied as an experience that that all the the major questions are answered, that the arcs are satisfying with yeah. where, where the characters get to in terms of their journeys. Yeah, the journey is complete. Yeah, yeah so I think for us, we, we feel very satisfied and very proud of the, of the series as a whole. Yes. I just have two questions. Oh. Two questions. Sorry. Um, one was, um, one thing I really enjoyed about the show, was that you spoke about this at the panel, was the, the diversity of it, how you, know, you said this is what our future you know, looks like. Um, and I was curious when you were thinking about that, how that worked into sort of the naming convention, like you use like cogs and clippers and things like that. Um, how did those names come to be and how did that relate back to, you know, creating this, this beautifully diverse show? Right. Well, it's, yeah, it's, the names were very important in terms of making it feel like its own thing, that this was not our, our world or a world you'd seen before in other movies. So the nomenclature of, of the series and the world was important. Um, and in terms of the the diversity and the effort we put into to making sure that this world reflected a future that is not our own. That there was, um, it was, it really, it really presented a lot of challenges in terms of the the Irish element, in terms of the UK element, getting the, the right actors into the roles. But um, it was something we really, really fought for, and I think achieved in many ways. Yeah. Um, but that was, and, and we sort of used. Um, Sort of a Japanese feudal structure. That's where it had you know the barons and the and the regents and the clippers and the cogs and the colts and so that's sort of where it where it came. So it was sort of taking that from, from it was Kurosawa really yeah. in terms of those great samurai movies. Yeah, um, like the samurai trilogy was a big inspiration for the show, um, and then using that those sort of also Chinese history as well mm. and the Chinese history of cinema and Wong Kar Wai is a big influence on the series in terms of the look, mm. the saturation. Um, House of Flying Daggers. My second question was um, just uh, for uh, for you guys, what your who your favorite characters were in the show and why? Uh, Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, should be pretty obvious. <laughs> that, why? <laughs> right. No, but I I really like the widow's character. I mean, there's so many characters I like. That's that's the thing is like there's so much to you know cling on to as a fan of the show. There's so many characters that you can like and hate and whatever, and so that's what makes it fun. You're not stuck with one person's storyline that can get boring if you're not into that person, you know. And so that's what I, I mean. I love watching Twitter blow up whenever an episode comes out because you see who people gravitate towards, right? And and it's a really kind of fun aspect of the show, you know. Yeah, and I think you know, it's like when you create the show, it's like you love all your children, um, and I think and not I think all it, the children. Not, 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 <laughs> some are problematic, but um, I think for us, it's. You know, we really wanted to, you know, land Sonny. And once we had Daniel, we kind of knew where that was going. He's like, he's like the old, he's like your oldest child who you focus so much attention on <laughs> and you go through. And then I think the widow we knew had the potential to be great. And I, I think that was, you know, a very surprising character once we got into it, that how much there was to do with her. And we really loved the relationship with her and Tilda. Until the once we had Allie, we were like, okay, uh, this is a great. Yeah. We knew this was going to be a great. You know, we had Tilda on paper, but then when Allie came in, it was just like, wow, she's great. And mm -hmm. so we knew we had this really wonderful mother-daughter relationship, which is something you don't see on television a lot, and something you certainly don't see in this show. But also, it was deeply messed up. Yeah, I mean, deeply messed. Yeah, 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 completely yeah. like yeah, bonkers. It was it was bonkers. And then you have, you know, like Lydia, which is the you, you talk about that one because well, Lydia is <laughs> someone who I think you watch the show and you have real expectations. She's the kind of like the bitch, the sort of like the schema. And over the course of the series, I think hopefully an audience will really begin to empathize with her. Right. And that she's not who you, who you, she, you really see her grow as an adult, that she becomes, after the sort of Quinn's gone, that she becomes her own person. 
and again, it's sort of empowering someone who's been in the shadow of a man to become powerful themselves. So that's a really interesting journey. So that was something that's very important. But you know, even watching the show today, Nick Frost really changed yeah, the show. Yeah, sure. yeah, he changed um, the show. So for us, that was, I think, the relationship of Stunny and Baji is just transformative. And something that, you say, we went into the show with very kind of serious intentions, but actually we realized that you need comedy to leaven the drama. And that was, so that really changed the whole show. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he's incredible. And yeah. just looking at the reaction today, the, the, he can get a laugh out of any, any laugh. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. He has such facility and he's such an amazing dramatic actor, comedic actor, and physical actor yeah. that is yeah. the triple threat. So that really, I think, really helped us. Yeah. Quinn, I mean, also amazing character. Like, yeah. he was that one you love to hate him, right? Like, he was so fucking slimy all the time. Well, he was, like, <laughs> what, but did you watch? You love yeah. watching his performance, yeah. right? And it was just amazing to have that kind of with Sunny and that relationship, that kind of very clear fight between these two characters. Well, he was so creepy. He was so creepy. But you, <laughs> needed creepy, that, yeah, creepy. you needed an act, especially in the first season when you're establishing these barons, because what are barons really but a cult of personality that's built around themselves? So you needed an actor who could bring that. and Be a cult leader, yeah. Yeah, and, and Martin brought it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Sonny knows I, that now. Yeah, yeah. Sonny knows that now. <laughs> Chop the heads off. Don't yeah, stand the yeah. You guys are really active on social media, especially Twitter. And Daniel, you answer us like all the time. We're tweeting to you. Um, why is it important for you to interact with your fans that way? Well, it's the first time I've experienced this because, like, I've only done films in the past, right? In films, you do the movie, you go to the premiere, you sit with a bunch of audience members, and then it's done, and everyone watches the movie on their own time. Whereas in TV, I can sit there and do the live tweeting and people's reactions are happening right there. You know, I've never experienced that before and I thought it was really cool and fresh. And to have this direct connection through social media with the fans was amazing, especially since we weren't growing in, in the mass market like I wanted the show to, you know. And, and to have those fans and that direct, direct connection was like a really special relationship that I'd never seen in, in my 20 years of acting, you know. Yeah. And so I really loved that, you know. I wanted to just foster that. And, and it's really, I think, with, with any show, it really, what's great about television versus film is that it becomes a conversation with your fans. And now with Twitter, it can literally become a conversation yeah. with your fans. I mean, we had, you know, there were fan sites for Smallville, but we never had social media the way it is now. And, and I'll be honest with you, you know, Twitter is usually a bastion of hate. And, but when we went there for Into the Badlands, I was like, wow, you want to feel good about yourself? Like, go look at the feed. Because, I mean, right. the fans are fantastic. People were really responding to the show. Yeah, from day that, one. That, from day one. day one. I mean, the, that the, was... The fans, if you like the show, you really like the like show. like the show, yeah. So, like, the, often, like, on uh, other shows, it's like, it's just, you get the hate, and it's just like, like oh. You know, yeah. like that kind of thing. But it was very clearly what was happening. Like, people were really falling in love with the show, and it was cool to see that kind of blossom right in front of you on social media. You know? and, and I think because it wasn't based on something else, you know, it wasn't based on a book series or Superman or something, is I think fans could come to it fresh and just have that experience of something new that they didn't have anything else to, to reference or judge it against either. Um, all the action sequences that happened from season one to season three, which was the hardest to prepare for? Gosh, <laughs> I don't know, I think the rain fight in season one made me go, oh shit, we're in this deep. Like, it was hard to make that scene. We were six days in there, and it was like in this studio, or eight days, yeah, it was eight days. And like fully wet the whole time. And, and also because the lights were so hot above, they had to turn this air conditioner on. So it was freezing in there, it was freaking cold in there. And then, but it was, it was like 110 degrees outside. So it was, this con it was like, it was so difficult to make that scene. But it was like, it kind of, put a taste in our mouth, okay, this is what we're going to deal with for the rest of this show. Because right, yeah. we're raising the bar here. It was the first, one of the first major fights in the first episode. We set the bar at that level. We're like, okay, we can't go back from this. So this is like, it's like oh shit, we just went off the cliff. We're going, right? <laughs> and so and that, I think that was difficult, but it set the tone and it set the, the everything for everything else. And so, I mean, other fights were definitely difficult as well, but that was the kind of like surprising moment for all of us, like everyone involved. like. The yeah. Alan Miles as showrunners, Steven as the director, uh, Didi, Master Didi as the choreographer. We're like, okay, this is what we're dealing with now. This is where we got to push ourselves. You know. It's uh, looking at the series as a whole and talking about fights. You said that they tell a story. What have been your favorite fights to uh, fights to tell? Wow, so many. 
<laughs> and, and for different, I mean, I love that rain fight. Yeah. I mean, I still think that's that's one of my favorite fights. It was a nice bag of tricks in that one. We yes. used so many like cool tricks in that. But it wasn't a maybe a plot. It was a plot. It was no, plot it fight. was a plot. It was, but it wasn't two characters fighting. Right. You know? That was just Sunny beating a bunch of people yeah. down. Right. Mm-hmm. And we did a lot of that for a season. But then I think one was really important to me was the moon fight with with Moon the first mm-hmm. that first time. Yeah. That episode. And in fact, that whole episode because it was like it was about these two warriors and them facing off. It was like very Akira Kurosawa. Yes. But then it was also very clear where Sunny's state of mind is. Like I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to do this. And this guy's like, No, you gotta. I'm calling you out. You gotta do it. You were gonna be my a thousand kill or you're gonna kill me, right? And it's like Sonny doesn't want to do it. And you really understood Sonny's mentality from that point onwards. He's not the guy that you saw from season one anymore. You know? Right. And so that one was really, really important to me. And then it was we met Sherman for the first time, yeah. worked with him for the first time. It was great. And we knew like after that episode, like we gotta bring that guy back. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, originally it was written just as an individual episode that this that Sonny was going through, but it was like so well, compelling. I'll say to Miles' credit when we were in the writer's room, because at the end of it I think Sherman did like that character was supposed to die. Yeah. And Miles goes, or we could cut his hand off, and if he's good, we can bring him back. back. And we were like, yeah, that's probably the good, because the, the last thing you wanted is like, God, this guy's great, and we killed him. So, you know, yeah, so that was, you know. Which we've done. We've, we, done, we, we've, we've made we, that mistake we, before, yeah. where you're just like, oh, why did we kill him? There's a character called Casta. Casta Dean, Dean yeah. Chapman played Dean Chapman. You know, the, in the first. I mean, it's a great first. scene when, when Pilgrim kills him, but it's like, oh. The, the, the kid was actually amazing. Yeah, yeah he was a great good mover, a great actor, yeah. a great kid to work with. Like, yeah. we were sad to see him go. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I actually called you guys. I was like, "Do we have to get rid of him?" I know. <laughs> I know. We're like, "Oh." <laughs> what has been some of the easiest makeup for you to deal with when you had all the tattoos or all oh. the I think the easiest was like when Sonny's clean. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking dirty like a lot of the time, right? Um, I did not like the Chow outfit because I hate white. Like, I hate all white. It's like, I can't you look really good in it. I, I know. I know. A lot of people say that, but it was very tight around the groin area. <laughs> <laughs> you could see if Sonny was excited or not. But um, it was very hard to move in that outfit because uh, it was very stiff. The leather was up here. It was like giving me wear marks on my neck. A lot of costumes like, did some damage to us physically moving around in them. Um, yeah, that one I didn't like. What was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, the easiest makeup, yeah. So, yeah, clean Sonny is the easiest. Like, you know, because I'm constantly getting marks put on me, yeah. scars, blood, this, yeah. like, I get bloody, bloody. The, well, how long was the tattoos in the end? Oh, the tattoo, yeah, the, whenever we shot like the back that. tattoos. How, how long three, four that? hours. Wow. Even even when we, like, got right. it good, it's still three, four hours. That means I have to come in at four in the morning to start doing makeup, you know? And so I'm glad that we used costume to cover it most of the time and that it wasn't shown most of the time because that would have been hell. <laughs> Thank you guys for saving me that. <laughs> Any scenes you wish that did make the cut on a shot? Oh, they did make the cut, or didn't? Yeah, yeah. And, and were there any scenes you wish that did make the cut on the shot that was original, that was cut from the shot? No, I mean I think we're uh, no, no. I think we're pretty <laughs> we're, we're, sort of, we're pretty ruthless in the yeah. editing room. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's I think one thing of the show is that it moves. There's no like um, no fat on the bone. It's just it moves, and that's. So we, we never regret cutting a scene. Yeah. We're very happy to cut scenes. Okay, we have time for two more questions. You mentioned Sonny being one of your favorite characters in all of the arcs you went on throughout the series. Is there one that you enjoy portraying the most? I think because I'm a father, the Sonny as a father trying to take care of Henry, like I really like that first fight scene in the trailer of season, season mm-hmm. three yeah. of the first episode because that also like put you very clearly what his mentality was. Don't fuck with my kid. I'll kill you. I'll kill you, right? Like, it, it, that's how I am personally. Like, my daughter, I'm fiercely protective of her. So I really related to that story arc of Sonny, like, right away. It was not anything I didn't get or understand or I had to even ask them about. You know, it was like, I totally get what his mentality is. The baby's sick. He's got to find a way to, to cure him, and he'll do whatever he can to do that. And he makes a huge mistake doing that, you know? But what would you do in that situation? You know, it's like if if you if your child's life is on the line versus protecting all of humanity, it's that's a hard decision to make, you know. And I really related to that character as being a father and and, and really really I felt like that was the moment that I really like understood Sonny. You know, I really, 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 really got him. You know? But I'd also love the arc of him trying to get back to Vale. That was romantic. Oh yeah. You know, he's this really violent guy 
but he's just trying to be a romantic and like I like that too. Yeah. You know, there's so much to like. And then even this this last half where he's trying to save the world world now. It's like a bigger scale problem, you know. There's everything else that he was dealing with is personal. Getting away from Quinn, uh, getting back to his love, saving his kid. Now this one is like save the world. So be a hero, you know. And that's a whole different thing. Well, season one, as Al calls it, is, is world glimpsing because we shot in New Orleans and we realized, quickly realized, we, that you can't shoot a show like this in America because you need money. So the move to Ireland really changed the whole show because we had the, the tax credit allowed us to really expand the world. It also had our location just outside Dublin. We could access to forests, to waterfalls, to the ocean to and, and these incredible um, castles and country houses yeah, and amazing island. country to shoot in. So, so we had an, an incredible crew as well who'd been they were just coming off um, Penny Dreadful. Penny Dreadful. So they had an incredible um, production designer and craftsman and the prosthetic team who could make you know like Baby Henry. You know, it was like this incredible doll. Um, and we had so many Super so, heavy. so many dead bodies we have, and they could just craft anything. Um, so there was that element and incredible practical effects. So it really allowed us to, to have a, a much bigger palette, and um, we exploited it to the max. Um, yeah, we had the best of what Ireland had to offer, all working on this show, uh, from everywhere from the stunt—I mean, the prop making, the weapon making—to to making uh, silicon baby Henry. You know, like yeah. all that stuff was was top level, and they were so passionate about it. Yeah, so it was great. And even this season, you'll see in the episodes to come, we we shoot in places that nobody had shot in before too you know places that had been had been off limits and then you know we were able to our great producer over there was able to get these places so yeah it was it was a Ireland was a fantastic place to to shoot yeah right, yeah, yeah absolutely exactly. so did we <laughs> um, last question and then we'll do a quick photo off right after yeah so final question uh, with this being the finale what is the last thing you want to leave the show the lead well, I, I hope it's a show that has been unlike a show that anybody's ever seen before. So, I, you know, something, that, something in a world of a thousand shows that feels unique, you know, that, that really, you know, showcases the best of, you know, what an action adventure show can be. Um, and they're characters that people will, you know, love and hopefully keep revisiting on Netflix. Yeah, I think, you know, we didn't get the mainstream love that we were hoping for. But I think with the streaming services and it being online, people will start, slowly start to discover it. And that's my hope. Yeah. And that, and that really the important thing was that we left a mark. We left a real, real big mark in terms of like raising the bar for, for this kind of action, creating this crazy world. I mean, it's, if you look at it on paper, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. You're like, how are we <laughs> going to pull this shit off? But we did it. You know, and, we, and we did it really well. And so I think slowly over time, people are going to recognize that. Hopefully, I'm hoping that. And we'll get that. We'll get that credit, you know. And um, and you're seeing it now. You're seeing Wu Assassins coming out. You see Warrior coming out. Like it's all. I can't say that it's not influenced by us. Right. Like I think we definitely influence those shows. And all the best to them, because I, we want to see more of that on, on television. We see and we started that spark. And I'm proud to be a part of that. Um, yeah, so I think that's the truth. I think it was hopefully we're ahead of our time yeah. in that way, and that yeah. we can be discovered. Yeah forever on Netflix or whatever it is but you know we set out to do something that hadn't been done before is incredibly unique and yeah. you know we're really proud of the show yeah. um, and, and, we're, and we're very you know grateful to AMC I mean it's a crazy show it was not based on anything and they <laughs> took the gamble and they went with it even when they frankly didn't understand it in season one but yeah, they, yeah but they I'm actually, pretty sure they didn't understand no it. no I think they you know you we tell the story it was like you see all of these dailies and you've got like a Hong Kong fight unit and like Guys in crazy costumes and like you know it just it was blood crazy. everywhere blood yeah. everywhere. And I also will say that yeah. our, our ratings actually was still very very solid. Yeah, and it's really about the economics of cable business rather than anything else, and that we're a very expensive show. Yeah. So it wasn't that we were like a bomb or it was, yeah. we actually were the top five show on the AMC. So yeah. it was it's a it's a really a, t a testament to them that they stuck with us as long yeah. as they did because that whole cable business is. Is challenged with yeah. I mean, with, I was grateful that they had the patience to let us run three seasons, yeah, you know, yeah. and really, really fall into stride and figure out what the show was. And we did that, I think. Yeah. So, 
there you go.